Hello and welcome to the course. This is a train the trainer course for people who are Prince to trainers and want to become P3 Express trainers. In case you are not a trainer and you're just looking for resources to learn P3 Express, I'm afraid this is not for you. Because this course explains everything from the perspective of a Prince to trainer based on the things they know very well, the things they are familiar with and so on. So if you're not a Prince to trainer and just want to learn P3 Express, you can simply go to the website, you can read the manual and you can take the Artify Center course to learn more about P3 Express. So in this course, we will go through six different topics. We will first talk about what's different for a P3 Express trainer and then how and when P3 Express is helpful for people. Who's the target audience for P3 Express? Then we will review NOOP, Nearly Universal Principles of Projects, which is the principles behind P3 Express. And we will compare it with the principles in Prince2. And then the main section, which is the longest one, is about P3 Express itself. We will go through everything, we will map it to Prince2, we will map Prince2 to it, and go through all the details. And then we will talk about the certification program, and finally, about where you can go from here. So what's different for a P3 Express trainer? The first thing that is really important is the license. P3 Express is not proprietary. Prince2, the PMBOK guide, and many of the other systems that we know are proprietary. They have copyright protection, and in order for people to use them, to give courses based on them, there are certain restrictions and one of the problems is that those restrictions can change at any time. So you may, for example, write a book about one of them or create an e-learning course about one of them. And the current setup may seem fine to you, but after a while, the owner of that concept can get back to you and say that from now on, in order for people to sell books, or e-learning courses about my topic, they have to do it like this and that and pay this amount of money and so on. And that's a risk for people who want to invest on those concepts. But P3 Express is not proprietary, meaning that it gives all the rights to the users. You can use it any way you want without even asking for permission, without paying money and without worrying for the future. It uses a license called Creative Commons. Creative Commons comes from an organization where they create multiple licenses, all of them for non-proprietary concepts. They have different types. For example, some of them limits people to using the concept for non-commercial purposes, meaning that if you create something based on that resource, your work should also have the same free and open license. The license used for P3 Express is Creative Commons Attribution. It doesn't limit people for commercial use. And for example, for trainers, it, it won't be a problem. You can create your own content and you can sell them. You can even create your own project management methodology based on P3 Express, give it another name and start selling it to corporates and, and earn millions of euros or dollars. That's absolutely fine. There's only one expectation. And that's attribution. Attribution is to say that what you've created is based on P3 Express. That's all. And one important point about Creative Commons licenses is that they cannot be revoked. So now that P3 Express is licensed under Creative Commons, what is there as P3 Express has to remain like that forever. And that's really necessary because you can imagine an entity who creates something, says that it's available for free without limitation. People invest on that, you know. When you create a course, you want to earn money from it for multiple years. But if they come back after six months or a year and say that, okay, from now on it's proprietary and I expect everyone to pay me some money, that would be really horrible. So to create that ease of mind, the Creative Commons licenses cannot be revoked. 
you can be sure that P3 Express remains the way it is forever. This non-proprietary nature of P3 Express has many consequences. The first one is that it makes P3 Express something that really belongs to the community because they practically own it. They have the rights to that. And that's one of the reasons that so many people have helped with P3 Express. Many volunteers have translated it to more than 20 languages in a really short time. They've helped with reviewing the new versions, the draft versions of the manual. They've helped with the templates, the specification of the exam, with conducting conferences in different countries, and a lot of other things. Also, a few years after the release of the first version of Petri Express, the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union uh, started funding Petri Express, which is really great. So the second version of Petri Express and a lot of activities that surround it was done with the support and sponsorship of the European Union. Petri Express won't be a single standalone project management system, but it will be part of a family. So there will be P3 Express for project management, P4 Express for program management, and P5 Express for portfolio management. At the time of this recording, P3 Express is about five years old. And the first draft of P5 Express is almost ready. It will be published in a few weeks, and the whole community starts working on it to review it, submit comments, and so on. And P4 Express is also being developed and it will be available very soon. In that sense, it may remind you of uh, the Axelus best practices where Prince is for project management, MSP for program management, and MOP for portfolio management. But there will be a difference here. All of these systems will be minimalist, easy to learn, easy to use, and easy to teach. What happens in the Axelos family is that many people take the Prince2 courses, they, they try to learn Prince2, but not many people go on with MSP and MOP. And that's a problem because we also need to have those other layers of management. In this family, however, the minimalist concept will help a lot. And and many more people will go for the other levels of management, and it will be a more effective ecosystem. All of these systems are focused on being practical, something that people can really use in their companies. It's not about terminology, it's not about memorizing and things like that. And finally, the last thing that is different is that in Petri Express, because of its non-proprietary concept, anyone can call themselves a Petri Express trainer. That's absolutely fine. There are no conditions and you don't even need to have a permission. However, there is a defined title of accredited Petri Express trainer. That one is different. For that, you need to be certified yourself, Petri Express certified, you need to have a minimum number of learners, have a minimum level of quality, and apply to become accredited. The accreditation is free of charge, and it's only and only focused on the quality of your work. For an experienced trainer who knows how to manage classrooms and is familiar with other project management systems like Prince2, it should be easy to become accredited in Petri Express. And by the way, as you probably already know, there are uh, training guides, train the trainer courses like this one, and even, for example, a guide for the instructor-led workshops. And all of these things are available for free for everyone, not even limited to accredited Petri Express trainers. So, how and when is Petri Express helpful? First, both P3 Express and Prince2 are in the project management layer. Above that, we have program management and then portfolio management. 
We also have layers below project management and the first level below project management is our delivery layer or production layer or technical layer, whatever you want to call it. In that layer, people are involved in the technical aspects of the project, in creating the product. And in order to create the product, there are two general approaches. One is predictive and the other is adaptive or agile. In a predictive method, we are relying on an upfront understanding of the product. We think about every aspect, we try to understand everything and create a design that is optimized and low risk. And then we will follow that design and the plan that comes with the design to reach the target. Throughout our way, of course, we will have deviations and we will try to recover from deviations. And of course, we will have changes because we cannot think about everything. This is the approach that is suitable to many types of products. When you want to build a bridge or send a rover to Mars or do a lot of other things, you really need to be predictive. But in some types of product, a predictive approach doesn't work well because it's very difficult to predict how the end users and the market will react. So instead of predicting, we'll create an environment for exploration. We will go on with the small subsets of the product. We check to see how it works in the target environment, collect feedback, and based on the feedback, we decide what the best next step is. That's adaptive or agile. These are mainly about what we do in the layer underneath project management. However, our project management system should also be compatible with it. For example, something like the old versions of the PMBOK guide, they were really designed to support predictive projects. When it comes to Prince2, it's really compatible with both of them. However, there's one difficulty and the difficulty is that people who use adaptive development usually prefer to have minimalist systems for managing their projects and Prince2 is not minimalist so they consider it to be incompatible. When it comes to p Express it's designed very carefully to be completely compatible with both of those approaches. It doesn't prefer one to the other it believes that both of them are valid and the choice really depends on the type of product. And based on the feedback in the past five years, people working with both predictive and adaptive systems are comfortable using P3 Express. P3 Express wants to be a realistic, practical system that everyone can really use in their projects. And the enemy of that is perfectionism. So P3 Express does not want to be perfectionist. You can think of it as the 80-20 rule. Instead of trying to target the 100% of the potential benefits of a structured project management system, we can target 80% of that with only 20% of the effort. That's a great achievement. And on the other hand, when you think about the range of projects, if we try to create something that is usable in 100% of the projects, it becomes really complicated because there are some projects that are really different from everything else. So again, instead of trying to be a system for 100% of the projects, we can only target 80% of the projects. And that helps us create a system that is a lot easier. So for a project that is life critical or is just huge, there are too many people in the project, p Express is not really designed to cover that. Although, even for those projects, using p Express is better than having nothing at all. And by the way, when it's about the size of the project, it's mainly about the number of people who are working in the project. But it also depends on the diversity of the skills in that team and the way those people work together. So for example, a construction project or a process plan project with 500 people 
that's just medium size. That's okay. We can use P3 Express for that. But an IT development project with 500 people, that's really big. That's really complicated. I don't know how useful P3 Express can be. It may not be the main target audience for P3 Express, but as I said before, if they don't have a proper system, still using P3 Express is a lot better for them than nothing at all. The perfectionism concept that I mentioned is really important in understanding Petri Express and also in explaining Petri Express. Because a lot of things in Petri Express are not as complicated as you would see in Prince2 or the Pembok Guide and other resources. And some people think that it's a bad thing, but that's actually a good thing. The usual analogy is the difference between a spreadsheet like Excel and a programming language like R or Python. The programming language is a lot more flexible, a lot more powerful. Think about all the people you know who use Excel. What happens if you force them to use a programming language instead of Excel? Most of them won't be able to use that. So being powerful and flexible like a programming language is not enough. It's about matching the needs. Many people like a spreadsheet like Excel. And for managing projects, for a normal project that 80% of the projects, something like Petri Express is probably a better match than Prince2 and the Pembug Guide, which takes a really, really long time for people to learn and start using. And as you've probably seen, most people either don't use them or they just think they are using it. They just have the documents and rituals without having the real dynamics behind the scenes. And they won't be able to take benefit from those systems. That won't happen when we use the right tool for the job. Okay, that's it. Let's go and start checking out Noop. Okay, the next topic is Noop. Nearly universal principles of projects. What happened was that after P3 Express was uh, published, the first version of it, there were a few comments from people suggesting the addition of values or principles to P3 Express. It sounded like a good idea. So the team started working on it. However, after a while, they realized that what they are doing, the type of principles they are uh, forming and extracting are really applicable to any type of project. Also to Prince2, to the Pemba Guide, to PMS Square, DSDM, XP, Scrum. They are almost universal. So they change the goal. Instead of having the goal of adding principles to P3 Express, they define a new project for creating a separate independent content and that's what we have right now called noop and it's a it's an interesting topic because it's modular it's separate from p3 express and therefore people who read it and use it won't be limited to using it in p3 express they can use it in any type of project and even for uh, prince 2 dsdm and those concepts that already have principles, still Noop is helpful because it gives you a new perspective to those methods. That's very interesting. You can see Prince2 from a new perspective and gain a new understanding. After Noop was published, uh, there, there was the second version of P3 Express. And the interesting thing is that when the second version of P3 Express was being developed, the team realized that some parts of Petri Express are not 100% compatible with Noop. So they made changes. And those are relatively interesting changes. I will mention a few of them as we go on through this course. Noop is available on noop.guide and it's a set of six principles. Each principle is called Noop 
which sounds like the same, but it has one P instead of two. So the one with two P's that stands for nearly universal principles of projects, which is for the whole package. And the one with one P stands for nearly universal principle. So there are six noobs and on the website, you can read all the explanations and each of them comes with a few examples. The first one is to prefer results and the truth to affiliations, meaning that instead of limiting ourselves as practitioners to one method and turning it into a cult, we prefer to be open to all of them. And that includes Petri Express. It's not supposed to become a cult. And as you've seen, as you know very well, there are many domains in project management where people do not exactly behave as open-minded practitioners. But that's a different problem. Okay, that was the first one. The second one, to preserve and optimize energy and resources. This one is a special. It has many different consequences. For example, one way of preserving our energy is to not get ourselves involved in the details of the work where someone else is supposed to do that. In other words, don't micromanage. Delegate properly. The third one is to always be proactive. Instead of waiting to see what happens, we want to be proactive. We want to think about it. It doesn't mean that we need, need to take action. Sometimes we are proactive, meaning that we will examine the, the situation, but we decide not to take action, and that's absolutely okay. But the thinking process is proactive. That's why we have plans, that's why we do risk management, and a lot of other things. The fourth principle is to remember that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. In order to have proper project management, we have to pay attention to all domains. There are many people who have really, really advanced planning in their projects, but they don't do anything else. And therefore, the plans that they create are not effective anymore. They can make their planning even 10 times better than what it is, and it won't make any changes because they are not paying attention to other domains in their project management system. The fifth one is don't do anything without a clear purpose. And that's extremely important for us. Many people create different artifacts and have different rituals in their projects without understanding the purpose of those things. And therefore, what they do doesn't make a difference. So, for example, instead of people creating a project brief in Prince2 just because Prince2 says so, the good approach is for them to understand why they need to have such a basic document at the beginning. And when they understand the purpose of it and understand what type of problems it wants to solve, what they will create, even if it looks the same, it will be more effective. And of course, when we limit ourselves to having purpose for what we do, and we don't do anything without a clear purpose, we actually do less. I mean, we realize that a lot of things that we used to do didn't really serve a purpose, so we can just let them go. The last principle is use repeatable elements. That's important because that makes it easier for us. When we, are, when we use repeatable elements, we use what we've learned before and we don't keep reinventing the wheel. And there are many types of repeatable elements, different types of checklists that you create and reuse in your project. They are perfect. Also, the cycles themselves, as we will see soon, cycles in project management when we repeat project management processes, or activities, they are also about repeating. They make things simpler. They help us have continuous improvement. And that's why we really like them. Okay, now let's compare it with uh, principles in Prince2. 
I think one thing that is obvious here is that noop principles are a little more general. They are a little more high level. Whereas Prince2 principles are mainly designed for Prince2, for the way Prince2 works. But anyway, let's go through each one of them and map them to noops. The first principle in Prince2 continued business justification, it's basically one aspect of the fifth noob of don't do anything without a clear purpose. That's both about the activities we have, technical activities in the project, or even project management activities, and even the projects themselves. All of those things should have a purpose. And the purpose for the project can be translated into its business justification somehow. So there is no separate principle for it in Noop, but it can be uh, extracted or deducted from the fifth Noop. And also the other thing that we have in Prince2 when it comes to the first principle is that we don't really want to continue a project if it loses its justification, right? We want to be mindful of it. We want to check it all the time and take action. And basically, that whole thing is about being proactive. We don't want to just keep going on with the project to see what happens in the future. So basically, the first Prince2 principle here also has a lot to do with the third noob. And it can be considered a combination of the third noob and fifth noob and something like that. The second Prince2 principle is defined roles and responsibilities. And again, here we don't have a separate principle for it in Noop, but defining roles and responsibilities. Why do we do that? Mainly because that makes things easier. People know what is expected from them and what they can expect from others and a lot of other things. So basically, it helps us preserve and optimize energy and resources. And besides that, if you let a project go on for long, roles and responsibilities will emerge somehow. They may not be completely clear, but they will form. But that may not be good enough. And we don't want to sit back and see what happens, but we want to be proactive. We want to do it ourselves. So it also has something to do with the third noob. Always be proactive. The third principle is to focus on products. Now, this one is a little bit special. It's a special because, well, you know very well what it means. It means we need to focus on the products instead of activities, right? But there are many projects which need to explore possibilities. They don't know what type of product they have to create. So instead of that, they focus on the results. And then based on that, they let the product emerge. That's basically all the agile projects, or at least the way agile projects are supposed to work. Now, I know what you may be thinking about. If it's something about the result instead of the product, then it's really a program and not a project. That's absolutely right, at least based on what we have in Prince2 and the rest of the best practices. But on the other hand, the common approach in the community is to call them projects not programs and use project management system instead of program management system. Think of DSDM, for example. It's a system, it calls itself project management, and then its main focus is on the results and not the products. And on the other hand, we also have Prince to Agile, where it puts the Agile delivery systems underneath Prince2 in one conceptual level below Prince2. And what you have underneath it when that's result-based. So in Prince2, we also have to be focused on results 
first and then product. So it makes things a little bit confusing, but in general, what happens is that in most types of interpretation, it's difficult to suggest focusing on products. But, well, if it's a predictive type of project, we have a product to focus on and it makes a lot of sense. But regardless of that, whether you want to focus on the product or the result or value, as some people say, it's mainly about having a purpose for the, for the whole project and being focused on that purpose, which is basically the fifth principle in Noob. So they are not the same, but the ultimate goal of the principle in Prince2 is close enough to the ultimate goal we have in the fifth Noob. The fourth principle in Prince2 is to learn from experience. And in Noop, it's seen as a way of preserving and optimizing energy and resources. Although, you know, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship here. And what I'm telling you is the strongest relationships. But when you think about it, for example, using repeatable elements also has something to do with learning from experience. But it's not as strong as preserving and optimizing energy and resources. The next principle is managed by exception. Some people consider it a really special and crazy type of principle, but it's really what we do in all projects, or at least we must do in all projects. It's about delegation. And that's a topic we have in preserving and optimizing energy and resources. We want to delegate for multiple reasons. One of them is this. And there are other things as well, because when we delegate properly, we value other people who are working in the project, and therefore they will be happier working in the project. We will have their buy-in and a lot of other things. But anyway, this principle in uh, Prince2 is a necessary principle for all projects. And I'm saying that because I've heard from um, quite a few people that managed by exception doesn't apply to agile projects, which is really not the case. The next one is managed by stages. Now, this principle is a little bit different. It is a good idea to manage by stages. There are, there are really good reasons for it. But it's not absolutely necessary. We can have really good um, project management systems, that are completely linear, and that's fine. It's just Prince2 and some other systems who prefer to have cycles. P3 Express is the same. It also has managed by stages, but it's not a nearly universal principle for projects. But some of the noobs may uh, lead you to having or selecting managed by stages in your project. For example, as usual, preserve and optimize energy and resources because that makes it easier. Using repeatable elements, having cycles is about repeating the process, repeating the activities. And the last one, tailored to suit the project environment. This is something we have to talk about. When it comes to tailoring, the concept and process of tailoring is really different in a maximalist system like Prince2 or the PMBOK guide and a minimalist system like P3 Express or XP or Scrum. The difference is that with a maximalist system, you cannot really start using the system unless you tailor it. And that's why we can say that you shouldn't even use Prince2 unless you tailor it. And that's why it's one of the principles here. But in something like P3 Express, because it's minimalist, because it's only about the minimums that everyone needs, and the simplest and most minimal way of doing those minimum things, then you 
don't have to tailor it when you want to start using it. And in fact, the recommended approach for implementing and using P3 Express is to do it as it is described without changes, letting it work for a while, and then gradually, and based on the feedback you get from your environment, do some trial and errors and make small changes and let it evolve like that. That's the tailoring method recommended for Petri Express. So it's not an upfront tailoring, but it's a continuous, gradual tailoring. But regardless of that, the fact that we need to tailor our approach in the project is something that is covered in the fifth noob. Don't do anything without a clear purpose. Because all the project management elements that we have need to have a purpose. And the purpose that they satisfy depends on the environment of the project and the product we are creating. Okay, that was it. Uh, reviewing the principles. Uh, we checked Noop, which is officially the principles for P3 Express, even though it's a separate project. So P3 Express has decided to use Noop as its own principles, and then we compared it with Prince2. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between the two of them, and they basically see problems and try to help from two different perspectives. And finally, Prince2 is really Prince2 principles are really created to support Prince2, the way it works, but Noob is created in order to be as general as possible and usable in every type of project. Okay, let's talk about Petri Express itself. What you see here is the process. And probably you notice that we have multiple cycles here because cycles make it really easier for people to use it. That makes it a routine. There's a certain number of activities they run over and over again. So instead of thinking about what they have to do, they just do it automatically. And then they can use their mental energy on solving the more complicated problems in projects. This is, of course, not entirely different from Prince2. Prince2 is also cyclic. It has an iterative approach to project management. We have managed by stages and go on with the project one stage at a time. However, there are two differences here. One is that we have more cycles. We have cycles inside cycles in P3 Express. The other is that the cycles are more visible in P3 Express and it sometimes seems easier for people to understand the nature of those cycles compared to Prince2. So regardless of that, let's take a look at the cycles. The big circle here is monthly, which means that we run a P3 Express project on a monthly basis. We manage it one month at a time. And from a Prince2 perspective, that's exactly what it calls managed by stages. The difference with Prince2 is that in Prince2, stages can have any duration. They don't have to be the same. And you don't have to make them fixed duration. They can have a fixed scope. It's up to you. But monthly cycles make sense to most projects. They organically have elements that repeat every month. So if we can match our project management to that, it would be really easier for everyone. And then inside the month, instead of event-driven type of activities, they are mainly time-driven. They happen every week or they happen every day. And those are the other two cycles we have here. And the nodes you see on the lines here, they are management activities. And those management activities are divided into seven groups. The first one is project initiation which is about creating a foundation for the project, planning, creating the high level for the project, because it's 
like managed by stages we have the high level plan first and then each month we will add details for the upcoming month and revise the high level plan just as you expected the same concept exists for every cycle so we start every cycle with a monthly initiation set of activities which is mainly about planning and then at the end of the month, toward the end of the month, we have monthly closure. Tie up the loose ends and finish our work for the month. And similar to that, of course, we have project closure, which does the same thing, but for the project instead of the month. The weekly management activities are about measuring progress and recovering from deviations. And then we have daily management activities, which are about working with uh, completed deliverables with issues, risks, and so on. And one thing that we have here at the end, which doesn't exist in Prince 2, is the post-project management activities. Those are a number of activities we run at the end of the project, um, actually when the project is ended. And we run these to check the benefits of the project, benefits realized from the product of the project, and see what we're going to do with them. This is basically, primarily, a program management or portfolio management activity, not a project management activity, because that's after the project is finished. But we still have them here because the sad reality is that most companies don't have portfolio and program management systems so instead of being idealistic it is added here for those companies to take benefit from these things and of course if they use a portfolio management system like p5 express or anything else like mop then most these activities will be mainly done in that layer instead of here. But what we want to have is for these activities to be done for every project. And there are only four artifacts here, or management products in Prince2 terms. These are the artifacts, the documents that we need to have, we must have here for this process to work. It doesn't mean that there are no other documents. For example, there are also some reports. But the structure and the way those documents work is not sensitive enough to bring them here. So they are left to the practitioners to decide what they want to do. But for these four documents, they are essential and we really have to talk about them. So as we go on, we will check to see how they work throughout the process and then at the end we can have a simple mapping of these documents with the management products in Prince 2 to have a better understanding of them. And when it comes to the roles, we don't have a lot of roles here. There's obviously the project manager, like what we expect from a project manager. And then there's a sponsor, similar to the executive in Prince 2. And there are multiple teams one or more teams working in the project internal or external for the internal teams each of them has a team leader who's connected to the project manager and for external teams they have supplier project managers who are connected to the project manager now something important here is that when it comes to prince 2 depending on how you interpret prince 2 a common interpretation is to have only one perspective to the whole work, independent of the entities who are involved in the work. So there's one organization and all the parties are inside that organization. There's one project and one Prince to structure for the whole project. And as I said, that's not the only interpretation of Prince to, but probably the most common one. But in Petri Express, that's not the case. We have multiple perspectives. So everything we talk about is from the perspective of a single entity involved in the project. So, for example, you are a contractor. You have a project with, a, I don't know, a governmental agency, for example. 
that governmental agency is your customer someone from your organization will be the project manager and someone from your organization will be the sponsor now you may have multiple subcontractors and each of them will have a supplier project manager who will be con connected to you if we see things from the eyes of one of those subcontractors their own project manager is what you call the supplier project manager that person will be connected to their own sponsor someone from their own organization and then they may have their own supplier project managers and the same thing happens here so for example if you think about the justification of the project it doesn't mean that there's only one justification for every party involved in the project each of them has its own justification. Each of them has their own reason for working in the project. They have to be aligned with each other, but they don't have to be the same. The main customer may be doing it for uh, increasing the quality of life in the community, but the contractor, the main contractor, may be doing it to earn money. And one of the subcontractors may be doing it to enter a new market without earning a lot of money. Now, what you document in your own artifacts is your own perspective. When it's required, you will add information about other parties' perspectives to make sure that they are aligned with each other. But don't forget that everything is from your own perspective. Now, let's go and review all the activities here. We start with project initiation. What we call project initiation here in Petri Express is practically a combination of the starting up a project process in Prince2 and the initiating a project process in Prince2. They are merged into one. The fact that Prince2 separates those two processes is actually interesting and it can be beneficial. But the problem is that in reality, people just don't do that. And that makes it more complicated for people. And that's why these two types of processes are combined into one activity group here. We call them activity groups. So project initiation is an activity group. Monthly initiation is another and so on. Now, the first thing we do to initiate a project is to appoint a sponsor. The sponsor is one executive in the company, someone who can help us have resources for the project and makes the high level decisions and so on. And that person is our contact point with the higher levels of management in the company. It's exactly like the sponsor, uh, like the executive in Prince2 or the sponsor in the Pembok guide. There's no difference here. Uh, although in many of the courses and conferences, it seems like while the concept of a sponsor is a very fundamental concept that we have in most systems, still many people have problems with that, problems understanding it. Maybe because it's been the norm to expect the project manager to do everything and to be accountable for everything, for the product that is created, for the results, of that product and for the benefits created by that and a lot of other things which is not really correct we cannot expect a single person to be good at so many different things there's a reason we have all these layers of management the project manager should be focused on project management on facilitation coordination conflict resolving and things like that so when you're giving courses i think it would be beneficial if you spend a little bit of time here explaining the sponsor concept after appointing the sponsor or at least making sure that the sponsor is appointed to the project the next one is to appoint the project manager and that that's what the sponsor does now this activity is a good place for you to discuss different types of expectations we have from a project manager. And the most important thing here is that the project manager 
is supposed to be good in management, in coordination, solving problems, negotiations, and so on. They are not supposed to be the best technical expert in the project. This distinction causes problems for many people. It's a good idea to also distinguish between the project manager and a team leader. And this activity is a good place to do that. After that, we appoint the key team members. These are the team members who will be working on the project if we decide to go on with the project. And we want them to be officially appointed at this time because we need them to contribute to the initiation. The result of this initiation will be used by the sponsor and other people to decide whether or not they want to run the project. That's why it's important to do it seriously. This is again one of the places where people have problems with, although the same thing exists in Prince too, and you will probably go through the trouble of explaining all of that to your learners, but here you have to do that again. They find it strange to have appointments where there's no decision to run the project. The next activity is to describe the project. That's where we try to understand what the project is about, what we want to get out of the project. And the information we gather will be stored in a document called Project Description. We will have some information about the justification of the project where we will copy that from the business case that is created in the portfolio layer or program layer. We will have some information about the expected cost and duration, information about requirements, expected quality, some description of the scope, and a list of stakeholders. And later on when we want to have information about the way we want to communicate with the stakeholders, we will add that information here as well. We don't expect the project description to be a long document. In many projects, two pages may be enough, or maybe three pages. But it's a simple document. You can see that something similar to the project brief in Prince 2. The project description is a basic, fundamental, high-level document, so we don't expect it to change so often, but it is still does. The simplest change is that when we identify new stakeholders, we have to go and add it there. And sometimes during the project, we come up with new requirements. Again, they will go to the project description. Now, these changes can happen at any time, but there's one place that we will be actively looking for those, and that's B1. That's our monthly activity for refining the plans. In Prince 2 terms, that's the manage by stages concept. You remember when I told you about the impact of Noop on the second version of P3 Express? One of the places was here. This activity was originally called something like create the project description, something like that. But suddenly there was this discussion that when we say create the project description, it doesn't communicate the purpose. It's only output oriented. And it creates the idea that having a project description is what we want. But what we want is not to have a project description. What we want is to have an understanding of the project. And the document that we create is only the byproduct of creating that understanding. And that's why the title is changed from something like create the project description into describe the project. Now it shows the purpose. As you remember, one of the, one of the principles was to don't do anything without a purpose. The next activity is identify and plan the deliverables. Here we will spend some time with the key stakeholders, key team members, and map the deliverables of the project. Create a breakdown of the deliverables. And we store that in a document we call deliverables map. Now this is one of those things that terminology really matters. The 
more common names for that is WBS for work breakdown structure in the PMBOK guide and many other resources or product breakdown structure in PRINCE2. But the problem is that these names seem to have created a, a lot of confusion for people. Most people don't have a proper understanding of what those things mean. In PRINCE2, the problem is not as big as the PMBOK guide, for example, because when you say product breakdown structure, it, it's really telling you that it's about the product. But when you say work breakdown structure, everyone starts to think about activities. But still, with the product breakdown structure, the phrase breakdown structure, because it also exists in work breakdown structure, it brings all that package. That's why P3 Express decided to use a completely new term. To start from scratch, no package, just it's a map of deliverables. So let's call it deliverables map. And it actually recommends people using a mind map to map the deliverables. It works very well because, well, for predictive projects where you use a scheduling application, many people start creating that uh, breakdown inside the scheduling software in Primavera or Microsoft Project or something else. That causes a few problems, that creates problems because the way it is done usually mixes activities with deliverables and people immediately start thinking about the details. But we don't want to have a bottom-up approach here. We prefer to have a top-down approach. That's why using a mind map really helps. And by the way, uh, not many people know what a mind map is, so it would be a good idea if you show them what a mind map is, and even you can go through an example. If you're not using the workshop plan and you prefer to have a lecture, it's a still a good idea to have an example here. You can decide about a simple project or a simple concept and then create a deliverables map for it in a mind map. And so, speaking of examples, in the previous activity, when it's about project description, most of the concepts in the project description are really simple. You won't have a problem communicating them, but there's one that usually causes problems, and that's the requirements. Many people mistake requirements for deliverables or features. So it's a good idea if you spend a little bit of time going through that. So, for example, you can imagine a project with them and come up with a few requirements, help them come up with requirements. And if something is not a requirement, explain why and help them trace it back to the requirements they had in mind. And then when they are done, use that list of requirements as your starting point for creating the deliverables map. That makes it a really practical example for both of these activities, A4 and A5. Based on this iterative approach to planning that we have here, the managed by stages concept, we have the high-level plan first, and then we detail it gradually once a month. Based on that, the deliverables map that we create here may not be as detailed as it will be at the end of the project. So what happens is that in A5, you will create a high-level deliverables map, and then each month in B1, you will add more, more detail for the upcoming month. And besides that, it all also contains the list of our deliverables, right? And sometimes in response to certain risks or issues, you may want to add new deliverables to your project. And because of that, C2, which is our activity for responding to deviations, as well as the daily activities, they can also make some changes to the deliverables map. In general, it can change in many other places as well. Finally, when we are done creating our deliverables map, we have to turn it into some form of a schedule. 
And for that, we have two different options. In some projects, based on the nature of the product, we have deliverables with a lot of dependencies. And therefore, our schedule will be a dependency-based schedule. That would be something you typically create with CPM, Critical Paths Method. You will use Microsoft Project Primavera or something else, create the schedule for that. So you bring the deliverables map into a scheduling software and use a dependency-based system to do it. But in some other projects, for example, typically IT development projects, you don't have so many dependencies or you can create your deliverables in a way that don't have so much dependencies between each other. And therefore, you can have a schedule, if you can still call it a schedule, but for the lack of a better word, we will call it a schedule. You can have one that is priority-based instead of dependency-based, meaning that there will be the list and you will prioritize it, you will order it based on whatever criteria you have, on their importance, value, and so on. So basically for that, you will have a task board, what many people may call a Kanban board. And you will go on based on that. But regardless, at this point, you need to decide about it and have one of these two or a combination of the two. It can be helpful in many projects to have a dependency-based system for the higher levels and a priority-based one for the lower levels, for the details. If you have the software that supports it, that would be a really good combination. The next activity is to identify risks and plan responses. Here, the team will get together, the project manager will have a workshop, and with the help of those people, they will come up with multiple risks. And they plan responses to those risks. Those items will be added to the follow-up register, which is our third artifact here. Something that is a special to P3 Express is that the follow-up register is used for storing risks, issues, change requests, improvement plans, and lessons learned. So basically, we have only one register for all of those. While in Prince2, in the PMBOK guide, and most other resources, there are multiple registers. This is an important concept for multiple reasons. The first one is that even though these may have different natures, may, and I'm not saying that they definitely have, but even if they have different natures, still in a simple system, we can have a similar process for managing all of them. And therefore we can have them in one place. And what do we want to do with them? The problem is that people do identify risks they do plan responses and a lot of other things, but then it just remains in a document and there's no impact. They don't do the most important thing, which is following up on those items. This is such a big problem that p Express decided to name the document follow-up register to be a continuous reminder that the main purpose you add something to this register is that you want to follow up on it. So I was talking about the reason they all go to the same register. The first one is that we can have a simple process that applies to all of them. And there's also something else that is, that is interesting. You identify something and it's about something that can happen in the future, it may happen in the future, and therefore it's what we commonly call a risk. You go on with that, you will have extra information in the register about your responses, about the things you do for it, but after a while, it really happens. Despite everything that you've done, it really happens. Now, it's turned from a risk into an issue. You continue following up on that, and finally close it. Now the closed item with all the information that you've collected organically 
becomes a lesson learned. So what happens here is that these items, risks, issues, change requests, lessons learned, and so on, they morph from one form to the other. And since they behave like this, it makes sense to have them in one place. And of course, that makes it a lot easier for people to work with these. We don't want to have a perfect setup. We want to have a setup that people can really use. And one last thing here, what there is in uh, Prince2 or MOR for risk management or the PMBOK guide about risk management, for example, that is more complicated than this, but even those things are not the absolutely accurate version of what we can have. Because think about it, for example, for what we have in Prince2. We have one table which contains risks and responses. Now, when you think about it, a single response can change multiple risks the state of multiple risks and if we want to be really accurate it makes sense to have two different tables one for the risks and one for the responses and then have a many to many relationship between because also there can be more than one response for a single risk but that's not even the end of it because the root cause of those risks think about that a single root cause can have a relationship with more than one risk and each risk can have a relationship with more than one root cause so if you want to be really accurate we have to break that down into two tables so we will have three in total one for the root causes one for the risk events or whatever you want to call it and one for the responses and then you can go on and on and on about it. And you can really write hundreds of pages about the ultimate risk management system. You, you will even reach the place where you say that the causal relationship in risks, that's not a, even a tree, that's a graph. We have to store it and show it as a graph, a non-tree graph, and so on. But what do we get out of it? Does it really help in our projects? Or something simpler is better? What I mean is that it's not a decision between having what we have in Petri Express or the ultimate accurate thing. What we have in Prince2 and the Pembok Guide and the rest is not the ultimate accurate thing. They drew the line somewhere and said that this is the place that we believe is good enough for most projects. That's the good trade-off between accuracy and utility. Petri Express draws the line somewhere else. So the difference here is a difference in degree, not kind. Okay, that was probably too much explanation, but... There have been questions about it in the past, and uh, as a trainer, you really need to know about these things. So, here in Project Initiation, in A6, we create our follow-up register and start by adding a few risks to it and plan responses to them. There is also a daily activity, D1, and that's where we also manage risks, issues, change requests, and so on. And that will update the follow-up register. One last thing uh, I should say here is that each item in the follow-up register must have a custodian. The custodian in Petri Express is like the risk owner in Prince2 and many other resources. It's a different name, a little more humble maybe. We expect the custodian to 
do the follow-ups to come back, update the item, make sure that it really happens and everything that you're used to when it comes to a risk owner. But it's not limited to risks because as you remember, we don't consider a fundamental difference between risks and issues and the rest. So any follow-up item needs to have a custodian. And something else that might be interesting to you is that every deliverable needs to have a custodian as well. And similar to follow-up items, the custodian will follow up the state of the deliverable, update it, reports on it, and the rest. You can imagine all of that. But it's a really good practice to have someone for each of these items, both follow-up items and the deliverables. So at this point, at the end of A6, we are done with our high-level planning. Before ending project initiation, there are a few other things we have to do. First, in A7, we have project initiation peer review. And peer review is a very important concept in Petri Express, and we use it a lot. When it's time for a peer review, you go and ask another project manager in your organization to come and spend maybe half a day with you or a few hours and go through everything that you've done in that uh, activity group and see if everything is okay. They bring a fresh set of eyes. There may be some mistakes that you cannot see because it's too familiar to you. It's very helpful because of that, because you can find problems. And there is also something else here. When you do it, you are learning from each other. And that's really helpful. When that person explains something to you, you learn from them. When they see your work, they learn from you. And the way it works in Petri Express is that each time you have a peer review, you go and ask a different project manager to come and review your work to help with the learning process. So here you bring another project manager. They will peer review your work, give you comments. You may want to make some adjustments. And then the result of that peer review goes to the fourth artifact, the health register. We use the health register for two purposes. One is the results of peer reviews and the other is the results of our stakeholder satisfaction evaluations, which we will talk about later. And as I said, peer reviews are really important. They are really helpful. People have been using it in their projects and they've been very happy about it. The feedback has been great. It's a really good idea if you insist on the importance of peer reviews. And even suggest if they cannot implement P3 Express or do not want to implement P3 Express, at least give it a try. Give peer reviews a try. Most people will like it. Besides A7, we also have monthly peer reviews that's done in B2. And one peer review at the end in our project closure, that's F3. The next activity is to make a go, no go decision. So we are ready. We've prepared everything. We have an understanding of the project. We've planned it in high level. And now it's easier for us to decide whether or not we want to run the project. So the project manager sends the information to the sponsor and the sponsor comes back with the answer. It's not so different from what happens in Prince 2. You may want to explain it to your learners that the sponsor may have to go to many different people. They have to get the permission or acceptance or anything else from the portfolio management system, from someone else, I don't know. But from the project manager's perspective, they only know the sponsor. They are not supposed to go and search and see who's supposed to accept it or for anything else. We have one point of contact between the project manager and the higher levels of management in the company, and that's the sponsor. 
As you can expect, we will have the same concept of go no go decision in our monthly initiation as well, similar to Prince2, and that's in our B3. If this whole uh, project idea is a request for proposal or something like that, if that's started with a request for proposal and you have an external customer, the go no go decision that we have here is where the contract will be signed. So you practically decide if you want to take part in that. You will send your proposal. And when both parties sign the contract, that's when you're done with this activity and you will go forward. After that is the project kickoff. It's a meeting that has two main purposes one is to communicate information and the other one is to have a little bit of team building actually the main purpose is team building especially in projects that have multiple parties multiple companies working together peers that may not know each other from before and this is the first point where you try to Create a common understanding, try to bring people together and start creating a real team. And we do that a lot in different scales, of course. We also have kickoff meetings every month because that's also an initiation. That's a smaller initiation, but it has the same pattern. And we even have kickoffs for our weekly cycles. But as you can imagine, the weekly kickoffs would be very simple and short. And the last activity for project initiation is to conduct a focused communication, which is also a very important concept in Petri Express. And we have it at the end of every activity group, of course, except for the daily management activity group. But what it means is that after each series of activities, we will have one predefined, structured way of communicating and a certain message that we are supposed to send. In here, in 8.10, we are supposed to let the whole organization know that we are going to start the project. And that's important because... We don't want everyone in the company to be only focused on doing a specialist activities. We want them to have an understanding of different projects that are being run in the company. Because when so, they can be aligned with the goals of our projects, their own projects, let's say. Okay, so we are done with project initiation. And at this point, we have a foundation for the project. We have a high level plan and we know whether or not it's it's a good idea to go on with the project. As we talked about before, the project initiation activity group in P3 Express is similar to the starting up a project process and initiating a project process in Prince2. It's like a combination of those two. Although the activities that we have here are simpler. We don't go through everything that you do in Prince2. Now, anyway, if the decision is to go on with the project, we do it in a monthly basis in P3 Express. And for each month, we will initiate the month and at the end, we will close it. The monthly initiation activity group is more or less like the managing a stage boundary process in Prince2, where we approach a boundary, which is the end of a stage, and we prepare the plan for the next stage. Now, there are, of course, some differences because in Prince2, for example, we do the planning before we start the stage. But here, the planning, the initiation is part of the stage. That's the first thing we do inside the stage. And as we talked about before, stages in Prince2, you know it very well, they can have any form or shape you want. They can be fixed scope, they can be fixed duration, or any combination of those things. But in P3 Express, our cycles are fixed duration. They are always one month. So in order to do the monthly initiation, we go through five project management activities. And the first one, B1, is to revise and refine the plans. 
There are two things we do here. One is to revise the high level plan and the other is to add details for the upcoming months. Not so different from Prince do really. Uh, one thing that is important here, some people may be confused, is that it is not limited to adding detail for the upcoming month, but it's also about revising the whole high-level plan. And that's especially important because even though we have this type of managed by stages, if you will, it's not mandatory for people to have a high-level plan and then detail it on a monthly basis. It is encouraged in P3 Express, but it's not mandatory because in some projects they really need to have a detailed plan up front because of many different reasons. That's okay if they really need it. It's based on the purpose. You remember it's one of our principles. If you have the purpose for that, if it's justifiable, do it. That's fine. It doesn't cause any problems for this type of process. So even for those people, who have an upfront detailed plan, they still need to revise it every month. So this activity B1 is a reminder for them to sit down, think about the plan and improve it, even if they don't have to add details. And that helps with a very common problem in projects. They create a plan at the beginning and then they put it on the wall and it just stays there like a painting. That's not the right way of planning. That, will, that won't help, really. We have to continuously update and refine our plans. This is where we do it here. And as a result of this activity, our project description may change, the deliverables map, and the follow-up register. The follow-up register may change because we may discover new issues or risks or other things. The main changes are in the deliverables map, but still sometimes we discover new things that are more fundamental about, for example, requirements. They have to go to the project description. And these documents that are the combination of all different types of plan that we have are the ones that we originally created in A4 and A5 and also a few other activities. And later on, we will see together that, for example, in C2, we will also adjust these based on our responses to deviations. We will get to that as well. So anyway, in B1, we refine our high-level plan and add details for the upcoming month. The next activity is to have the monthly cycle peer reviewed. It's a concept similar to what we saw before. It was in A7 and toward the end of project initiation. And we will also have it in F3 when we want to close the project. So basically when you refine your plans, you go and ask one of the other project managers in your company to come and help you by peer reviewing your work. And as usual, the results will be stored in the health register. Based on the results of the peer review, you may want to make some adjustments. And after that, you go to B3, which is another go, no go decision. The first one we had was in A8 at the end of project initiation. And now we have one in the monthly initiation. So again, you send the updated information to the sponsor and ask them to get back to you with the answer. Should we go on with the project or stop it? The next activity is to kick off the monthly cycle. Our first kickoff was at the end of project initiation A9. That was for kicking off the whole project. And this time we are kicking off the upcoming month. And we keep doing that every month. And as we will see, we will even have that for the weekly cycles. But there's a difference here. When it's a shorter cycle, the kickoff meeting becomes shorter and simpler because we don't want, for example, to spend a whole day kicking off a weekly cycle. That won't make sense, right? That makes sense for the project kickoff in A9. It's a good idea to spend a whole day, but not for the weekly ones. And for the monthly, well, you definitely want to spend only a few hours, maybe half a day or so. And as usual, like every other kickoff meeting, we have two purposes. One is team building and the other is to talk about what's going to happen in the upcoming month. 
And the last activity, as usual, like every last activity in every activity group, is to conduct a focus communication. In this time, in this focus communication, we will tell everyone about what's going to happen in the upcoming months. It's important to keep it simple and short. If you want to send really long emails once a month, people don't read it. All right. So when we are done with the monthly initiation, we start with our weekly management. There are certain things we do here, and they are mainly focused on monitoring and controlling. We start with C1, which is to measure and report performance. We check the progress of the project, compare it to the plans, and create one or more reports. In general, in many projects, stakeholders are different, and therefore one report may not be suitable to everyone. Some of them prefer really short reports, half a page or one page, and some of them really want you to send them detailed reports. So to keep it uh, effective and also to satisfy every stakeholder, in many cases, you realize that you need to have more than one type of report. In that case, you will define those reports and you go to your project description. There's a list of stakeholders and you mention which stakeholder is supposed to receive which type of report and you create and send it. And for the measurements, it is highly recommended in Petri Express to be focused on creating forecasts. How much time do we need to finish the project? How much money do we need to finish the project? And things like that, which is in fact similar to what we have in Prince2. And some people in projects, when they measure performance, they are focused on abstract calculations. For example, comparing the actual progress to planned progress. Those things are what we need in order to come up with forecasts, but those are not the things we report to managers, and that's important. They may be even confusing, so we have to be very careful with that. And in this saying, there is really no difference between P3 Express and Prince2. There are some differences, though. First, in Prince2, we have both the checkpoint reports and the highlight reports. Here we have one type of report. That one type can have different formats, but it's still one type of report. And what we have here is similar to the highlight reports in Prince2. What happens is that we really insist on having multiple perspectives. So if this is your perspective to the project, then what you create here as a report is similar to the highlight report in Prince2. And for your internal teams, we don't define a certain report here you just go and talk to the team leader and get the information that's enough in most cases if you really need to you may define a report for them but if there are external teams they will have their own perspective to the project they will have their own p3 express setup and in that perspective, they will create certain reports that would work for them, like a highlight report in Prince2. And they will also send you the report, in which case, for you, in your perspective, would work like the checkpoint report in Prince2. So that's how we can compare these. And the other difference here is about the frequency and format of the reports. In Prince2, it tries to be more flexible. So for the checkpoint reports, you set them in the work package. And for the highlight reports, you set them in the communication management approach. You set the frequency and format. But that is a level of detail that may not be required in most projects. And that's why it's fixed here. We simply have weekly reporting for everything. But to be more accurate, in fact, what we have here is weekly measurement, monitoring, and when it comes to reporting, we have weekly input for reporting. For some types of report, for some formats, you may actually want to create and send the report every week. But for some of them, you may want to do it every other week or once every four weeks because the stakeholder wants to have monthly reports. That's okay, and that's still here, but it doesn't happen every time that you run C1. After measuring progress, the next activity, C2, is to plan responses for deviations. 
in most cases we have deviations that's okay that's really natural and every time we have to check and see how it is impacting our forecasts and if there is a deviation we have to come up with a response to recover from the deviation or to change our goals to change our targets and here the project manager is supposed to have an understanding the project manager and the sponsor that if the impact is lower than a certain level then the project manager decides and if it's higher than a certain level they will escalate it to the sponsor which is exactly like PRINCE2, the manage by exception principle in PRINCE2. The difference here is that it's not mandatory to create uh, official thresholds because it's really difficult sometimes to measure those thresholds. There are lots of practical problems in doing that. So it is basically done intuitively because people just can do that. It's not that complicated. They can understand their own level of responsibility. However, it is said in the manual that if you think that you're running into problems and you cannot create a common understanding, then feel free to create thresholds and uh, add them to your project description. Say, up to this level of impact on time or money or something else, the project manager decides and otherwise it will be escalated. Regardless of that, whenever there's a deviation, we have to have a response for it. And the response will be reflected into the deliverables map and the follow-up register. In some cases, it may impact the project description. If your response is a follow-up, is an ad hoc follow-up, then it goes to the follow-up register. But if it's about a change in your plans, it will impact the deliverables map. Then we have C3, the kick off the weekly cycle activity. It may sound a little bit uh, unexpected here, but first of all, it has to be really short because it's done every week and it's really limited to the internal team members. Now, it is added here because even though we have a plan and we involve everyone or every key team member in creating that plan, Still, the plans are not ideal. There may be conflicts in what we've planned that we didn't see before. That's why we have this kickoff meeting here. We will go through what we are going to do in the upcoming week with key team members. And if there's going to be a conflict, they will discover it here. They will talk about it and they will fix it before it is too late. And the last activity, as usual, is to conduct a focused communication. We send an email to everyone. Well, it's mainly the internal team members, but you may also decide to add your external stakeholders, some of them. It depends on the project. But anyway, you will send an email and tell everyone what's going to happen in the upcoming week. It serves a purpose similar to C3, to our kickoff, but this time... It has a different format, it creates other opportunities for discovering problems, and also it has a wider audience. You cannot bring too many people to the weekly kickoff, so you usually limit it to the key team members. But they may not discover all the conflicts. So C4 is your last opportunity to discover the conflicts before it is too late. It also helps align everyone with the project, keep them informed, keep them engaged, and so on. Okay, so that's how we do weekly management. And as you saw, it's more or less similar to the controlling a stage process in Prince 2. The other things, especially from controlling a stage process that we do are in the daily management cycle. In the daily management, we have D1, which is for managing risks, issues, and change requests. So you will be continuously looking for those things, and as soon as you find something, you will add it to the follow-up register and assign someone as the custodian to that item, and you go on with your life. And D2 is to accept completed deliverables. This is where we really insist on 
completing things before going on with new deliverables. We really want to encourage people, team members and team leaders and supplier project managers to complete one deliverable and receive approval from the project manager and then go to something else. Because if we have a lot of 99% done deliverables, it becomes really risky. There is a big risk of rework and things become unpredictable for the future. So that's the activity we have here. And it's not super special, but it's still it's a little bit difficult for some people to digest and understand. So it would be a good idea to spend some extra time here talking about this concept. And also the other problem that we have here is that uh, in many projects, the project managers are not comfortable accepting completed deliverables because they feel that they will be forever responsible for that. They feel that if there's something wrong with that deliverable and I approve that, then I will run into problems in the future. So they postpone it, which is not a good idea. It's always great if we can create an environment where the project managers feel more comfortable accepting this responsibility. So that's how we go on with our monthly cycle. We initiated the month, we went through the weekly management activities, which are mainly about monitoring and controlling, as well as daily activities. When we approach the end of the month, we will have a monthly closure. The first thing we do in monthly closure is to evaluate the stakeholder satisfaction. You will send uh, surveys to all the people, internal team members, and the customer, the subcontractors, and some other external stakeholders. Not necessarily to all of them, but many of them. And ask them a few questions about the project. You want to understand how comfortable and satisfied they are. There are a few example questions in P3 Express, but it's really up to you to decide what you want to do. It is recommended to have anonymous surveys to make people as comfortable as possible. We want to hear what they really have to say. So as you can imagine, the whole idea is that we don't want for the problems to pile up and explode. If there is a problem, we want to find out as soon as possible. When it comes to internal team members, we really want to be sure that they are happy working in the project. When you collect the answers, they will all go to the health register. So that's the second concept we have for health register. First, we have the peer reviews, the results of peer reviews, and the second is the results of the stakeholder satisfaction evaluations. After that, we have E2 to capture lessons and plan improvements. We will have a workshop. We will invite all the team members to come to the workshop. We will go through the results of a stakeholder satisfaction and then ask them to design improvement ideas for us. We can use uh, something like the Delphi technique to, to, to do that. And it's a great thing because you will be using all the ideas that are coming from a really big team of people who are working in the project, or at least relatively big team, depending on the size of the project. But also, you show those people that they, their opinions matter to the project, that they have a real role in the project. They, they will really like it. And because they are the people who come up with those plans, you will have their buy-in chances are higher that those plans will succeed. So you let them plan improvements and then you will add them to the follow-up register. Those are things you want to follow up on. And as usual, whenever you add something to the follow-up register, you also need to assign a custodian for that. At the end of the activity group, as usual, we have a focus communication. This time you send a message to everyone and tell them, uh, give them a summary of the achievements that they had during the month. Okay, so we go on with the project one month at a time with uh, our monthly cycles, weekly cycles, and daily management cycle. And we go on until we are done with the project. 
we are done creating the product or we are supposed to cancel the project. In both cases, we go on with the project closure activity group, which is more or less like the close a project process in Prince2. The first activity here is to hand over the product to the customer. And that can be the internal customer or the external customer. Now, this concept depends really on the type of product you have. If it's a piece of software, for example, you will be giving them a copy of the software, although they may already have a copy. So it's not a big deal. But if it's a physical product, then you really hand over the physical product. And for example, if it's a building, then the physical security of the building will become the responsibility of the customer instead of the project team. And of course, in order to be able to do this, we have to double check our deliverables map and the follow-up register to make sure that everything is finished and closed. And in case there are problems when you want to hand over, you will open new items in your follow-up register and go on with it until it's over, and then you can really hand it over. In some types of project, it is common and accepted and actually a good idea to have a few remaining minor activities, activities that take too much time. And if you want to keep the project open for those activities to finish, it will be just too much. So instead of that, you will create a document of all the remaining activities in the project, those minor activities, both parties sign it, and then you will hand it over to the maintenance part in your company. That's a good idea, so you can close your project and focus on something else. Depending on the type of contract or the industry norms, uh, you may have certain guidelines on what can be included in that list. But anyway, that's what we do here, and we hand over the product to the customer, we receive their approval, and we go to the next activity. Something that is really important here is that if it's going to be the first time you try to receive approval from your customer, it becomes a really huge activity. In order to make it easier, you can put more effort into D2. D2 is where we expect the project manager to check the deliverables from teams and accept them. If you want, you can make that process a little more elaborate and also receive a preliminary approval from the customer so that when you're at the end of the project in F1, you will have less work to do. Things will be more predictable. That's a great idea if you do. So that's it. We hand over the product to the customer and receive their approval and we are almost done. We go to the next activity which is to evaluate the stakeholder satisfaction for the last time. This one is a little bit different from the previous ones because in the previous ones, in the monthly cycle, we evaluate the stakeholder satisfaction to prevent problems from piling up. We want to improve something. But here we are at the end of the project. There's no room to make improvements. So basically here we want to understand how we did. We want to evaluate ourselves. In the monthly evaluations, our focus is mainly toward the previous month. And actually in your surveys, you have to pay attention to it and create the questions in a way that brings the focus of your audience into the previous month. But here, our scope is the whole project. And again, you have to make it clear in your surveys. And what we learn here is something we can use in our future projects. So the purpose of this activity goes a little bit beyond the borders of project that we have right now. Then we will have another peer review to make sure that everything is okay. And then we will archive the project documents. It's a very important activity here. The problem in many projects is that Everything that we've learned, everything that we've created is not transferred to the future projects, even though these things are really helpful in the future. So here in this activity, we really want to make sure 
that our documents are properly archived and accessible to the future projects and they are formed in a way that they are other people can really understand them sometimes we create documents that only ourselves at that moment can understand even us in two or three months from now when we read the document we will have trouble understanding them that is a huge problem so throughout the whole project we must have that in mind are we able to understand what we are creating here a year from now or two years from now can someone else in our company who was not involved in this project understand them think about these things when you're creating the documents so that you can make them really helpful and then we have the activity to celebrate and that's important here we want to Bring all the people who have been involved in the project and celebrate to show them that we really appreciate what they've done for the project. It's another way for us to create awareness for the projects. We want people to go beyond their specialist activities and think about projects. Because when they do, they will, they will be more collaborating with each other and their activities will be aligned with the goals of the project instead of being only their specialist activities. And again, similar to stakeholder satisfaction evaluation, this is not something that helps our project because our project is almost finished here, but it's an investment for the future projects. And again, this is the end of an activity group. So the last activity is to conduct a focused communication. This time, instead of the project manager, it's the sponsor who sends the message to everyone. They will announce that the project is going to be closed and thanks everyone and says kind words, things like that. Okay, so at the end of project closure, the project is over. And we don't have the project team anymore. We don't have the project manager anymore and so on. But still we hand over some of the documents to the sponsor, the person who was the sponsor for the project, or someone else who's set by the portfolio management team or program management team. And that person will be responsible for that little cycle at the end of the project the post-project management cycle or activity group. And that's a cycle for evaluating and taking some actions. Depending on the type of product, it will go on for one to five years and it repeats every three to six months, again, depending on the type of product. For some types of project, the post-project management cycle may seem more natural. If, for example, you create a piece of software for, to be used in your own organization, then it makes a lot of sense to have this. But there are many organizations out there who do projects for external customers. And for them, the benefits evaluation is a little more straightforward. And they may think that they don't need to have it. But P3 Express really insists on the fact that everyone has to do it. In those cases, when you think that benefits evaluation is simpler, you can have a shorter life cycle for post-project management and longer cycle times. But you still need to have it, especially because what you get out of a project for a typical contractor type of organization is not really limited to the money you get for doing the project. You are also building your reputation. You are expanding your network of customers. And these are things yet that you really need to exploit. And that is basically done in this cycle. So the first activity in the cycle is G1, evaluate the benefits. The, the sponsor or the other person responsible for post-project management takes a look at the benefits, the expected benefits, the unexpected benefits, and these benefits, evaluates all of them. What are we getting out of that project that we did a long time ago? And then in the next activity, based on the information we've generated, we want to generate new ideas. 
Now there are two types of them here. One is minor small activities that can increase the benefits we generate from that product. The product is working, it's generating a lot of good things for us, but we see that, for example, with uh, three or four person days of work, we can increase the benefits by 10%, which is great. So the sponsor goes and finds a way to do it. That's one thing. And the other thing is that when you observe the way the product is working, you may be able to come up with new ideas for new projects or new programs. In that case, again, the sponsor goes and talks to other people in the portfolio management system or anywhere else and tries to initiate that new project. And the last activity, as usual, is a focused communication. And here the sponsor or the other person responsible for this cycle sends a message to people who were involved in the project and tells them about the benefits realized from the project. And you can guess the main purpose here is to create a sense of projects, to help people understand what it means to be involved in the project. And the feeling that you create in those people helps them be more aligned with the goals of future projects. That's the main reason we do it here. Okay, we're done reviewing the process in Petri Express, and we talked a little bit about the way those processes relate to Prince2 processes. Now, to make it cover everything here, it can be a good idea to also see it from the Prince2 perspective and see how each of the process activities are covered in Petri Express. So let's start with the first Prince2 process, starting up a project. These are the activities that you know very well, and you've already seen that we have two separate activities for appointing the project manager and the sponsor to the project. And by the way, what Prince2 calls an executive, we call sponsor in P3 Express. The next Prince2 activity is to design and appoint the project management team. Now, there's something important here to remember. It's not only about appointing, but also about designing. And the main reason to have such a thing in Prince2 is that Prince2 has primarily by default or with the most common interpretation has a single perspective to the project. So all the different parties involved in the project will be in a single perspective. And therefore it becomes a little bit complicated on how you want to put those people together. For example, where does your senior user comes from, when your, where your senior supplier comes from, who should be the executive, and so on. There is a design there. But in P3 Express, as we talked about before, we don't have a single perspective. Each party involved in the project has their own perspective to the project. They have their own project manager, their own executive, and then they are connected to the teams, either internal or external or both. As a result, the organization will be really simpler in P3 Express, and we don't really need to design anything. We just have to appoint people. The similar activity we have in P3 Express is appointing the key team members. Now, if you have a big project, a single project manager won't be enough. They need people to support them in their project management activities. So you will appoint more people. But it's not limited to that. We are mainly thinking about the key technical people here because those are the people who would help us plan the project, initiate the project. The next principle activity is to capture previous lessons. This is not explicit in P3 Express. We don't have an activity for that, but it's a good idea for project managers to do that. Something related to this concept is that in general, in P3 Express, we are more focused on creating a sort of document that is usable in the future, creating a type of lessons that are really useful in the future, instead of being more focused on capturing those previous lessons. Obviously, both of those things have to be done in order to be practical and effective. But P3 Express sees most of the problem in generating an 
storing the lessons rather than going back and picking the related ones. The next principle activity is to prepare the outline business case. And you know very well that this is done by the executive, not the project manager. An important topic in Petri Express is that we consider the business case outside the project. We do use the business case a little bit. It, it matters to us, but it doesn't belong to the project level. Because the business case about the justification of the project and justification is something that relates to the whole organization, to all the projects that you have, all the programs and operations. Therefore, understanding, designing, evaluating and updating the business case can only be done properly in the higher levels, in the portfolio management layer. They would need some of our input, for example, the estimates, obviously, but that's not enough. So remember that in Petri Express, business case is not inside the project boundaries. Regardless of that, the first time we have something to do with the business case is in A4, when we want to describe the project, when we want to understand the project, we go and ask the higher levels, the sponsor, the portfolio management or program management layers to give us the business case. We will take a look and we will reflect a summary of the business case into the project description. A simple explanation of the justification of the project because we want everyone in the project to know why we are doing the project. The next principle activity is to select the project approach and assemble the project brief. A document that is somehow similar to the project brief is the project description in Petri Express. However, there are many differences here, really. The most important difference is that the project brief in Prince2 is a temporary document, temporary management product. And later on, you will replace it with the project initiation documentation. But that's not the case in Petri Express. We don't replace the project description with something else. It remains there and it will be used to store that type of information for the rest of the project life cycle. The next principle activity is plan the initiation stage. And obviously we don't have something like this because we don't have separate uh, starting up a project and initiating a project processes. They are done together. So let's move on to initiating a project process. The first activity is to agree the tailoring requirements. And as you remember, our approach to tailoring is really different in Petri Express compared to Prince2, mainly because Prince2 is a maximalist system and Petri Express is a minimalist system. So with Prince2, it's very difficult to use it without tailoring, and therefore we want everyone to start by tailoring. But in Petri Express, we have a minimalist system and it's something that they can use in every project. In fact, what we have in Petri Express are the things that are in common for all projects, more or less the same way. So they can start without tailoring. And in fact, that's recommended because when they start tailoring, sometimes they overdo certain things. They make the system too complicated that they can't really use it. So. The recommended approach is to just use Petri Express the way it is and then for larger projects or for a continuous flow of projects, you will start making adjustments based on the feedback you receive from your environment. So long story short, we don't have something like this activity in Petri Express. We don't have upfront tailoring and instead we have a gradual tailoring that is done throughout the project. The next activity, prepare the risk management approach. Similar to what we talked about about tailoring, here we have a really simple approach to risk management, which is enough for typical projects. So they don't need to worry about that and come up with a special approach at the beginning. We are not trying to get 100% of the potential benefits of a structured risk management system. 
we only target 80% of that with 20% of the effort, which makes it more realistic, makes it something that people can actually use in their projects. So nothing like that in Petri Express. When it comes to quality management, uh, another difference in perspective plays an important role here. And that's the fact that Petri Express considers another management layer underneath project management. And that's the technical management layer. That's where you are dealing with the technical aspects of your product. And when it comes to quality management, it has two different uh, types one type is the management of the quality of our project management activities that is part of petri express it is embedded here that's where in every cycle we think about the way we work and we try to improve it that's also our way of tailoring but the other one which is usually what people think of when they think about quality management is the quality of the product we are creating and when it comes to the quality of the product, it is seen as a responsibility of the technical management layer, one that is below Petri Express. So we leave it to them, but we will make sure that they are doing it properly and where they need help, we will go on and help them with coordinations and collaborations and so on. The next activity, prepare the change control approach. Similar to what we talked about about risk management, we have a simple approach, we just use that, we don't go through a lot of detail. So nothing like this in Petri Express. The next one, prepare the communication management approach. We don't have something like that, but we also have. So basically what happens is that one part of the project description is the list of stakeholders. And as we go on with the project, we, we pay attention to the way the reports work and if necessary we will create more than one type of report if you have just one type of report that's okay but if you have more than one type of report and that's what we do in c1 then we need to reflect it into the project description and therefore what we have in the project description would work like the communication management approach however it's not done upfront. It's something that happens gradually throughout the project. Set up the project controls. We don't have a separate activity for it. There's uh, some type of advice in P3 Express telling people that they have to be focused on forecasting and creating a setup that helps them come up with meaningful forecasts for the project. The next principle activity is create the project plan. And in Petri Express, that's what we do in A5, identify and plan the deliverables. We start by creating a deliverables map and then we go on with creating the schedule, which is either a dependency-based schedule or a priority-based schedule. And sometimes it can be a combination of the two of them. The next principle activity is refine the business case. And again, we don't work with business case here inside a Petri Express project. But when you think about it, in A8, when we have the make an, a go, no go decision, we are sending a, the information to the sponsor and the higher levels of management. And basically, they will use that information, including our more reliable estimate for the duration and cost of the project to refine what they had in their business case. So refining the business case doesn't happen inside Petri Express, but A8 is where we send the information to higher levels and that's where they do refine the business case of the project. And the last one in initiation is to assemble the project initiation documentation which is something basically about packaging the things we've done so far in that process. And we don't do that in Petri Express because we don't have millions of documents. It's a lot simpler than that. We have just four documents. Okay, the next process is managing a stage boundary. The first activity, produce an exception plan. Generally, in Petri Express, we don't break the cycle to create an exception plan. But when we measure in C1, we move forward to C2, 
if there's any deviation we try to recover from deviation and if it's really big we will escalate it to the higher levels and based on their decision we will revise the plan and go on like before so the concept of revising the plan is there but we don't have the concept of exception plans and breaking the cycle the next two activities plan the next management stage and update the project plan these are done in b1 revise and refine the plans we do exactly these two things we revise our high level plan and we also add details for the upcoming month the next activity is to update the business case and again we don't do that inside the boundaries of the project inside p3 express however what happens in b3 make a go no go decision is that we send the information to the sponsor and the sponsor will share it with other people in the higher levels of management and they would update the business case if they need to and the last activity in this prince to process is to report management at stage end that's what we do in e3 our focus communication. You remember we have a focus communication at the end of each management group and these two map to each other. All right, moving on to the next Prince2 process, controlling a stage. The first activity, authorize a work package. We don't have an explicit activity for it. It's something that you do as the project manager. It's not that official in P3 Express especially based on the fact that some of the things that a, typically a Prince2 project manager has to do in a work package are predefined in P3 Express. For example, the frequency and format of the reports. So those parts are not needed and therefore the importance of the whole thing will be a little bit lower than what is there in Prince2. The next two activities, review work package status and receive completed work package. These are what we do in D2, accept completed deliverables. Instead of work package, we call them deliverables. And this activity is mainly about accepting completed deliverables. But as we talked about before, it's also about encouraging team leaders and external project managers to finish what they are doing before moving on to new deliverables. And in order to do that, you have to check the status of those deliverables with them. The next principle activity is capture and examine issues and risks, which is exactly like D1, manage risks, issues, and change requests. So not exactly, but they are really similar. The next activity, in Prince2 is review the management stage status. Now, as you saw, a lot of things in controlling a stage are our daily activities in Petri Express. But this is one of the things that are not daily, but weekly. And that's our C1, measure and report performance. The next Prince2 activity is our next Petri Express activity. Take corrective action, plan responses for deviations. The next Prince2 uh, activity is report highlights. And for us, the similar activity is C1. That's where we measure and report performance. And the last activity here in Prince2 is escalate issues and risks. In the context of controlling a stage process, not in general, but in, in the context of this process, what it means is what we practically have in D1 and C2. D1 is about isolated risks and issues and change requests. Each time we identify something, we document it, we assign custodians, and then if it's above a certain threshold, and the threshold is normally implied, but if you want, you can make it explicit. If it's beyond that, we will escalate it to the sponsor and the sponsor will, may send it to higher levels as well. The other related activity is C2, in which we do the same thing, but there's a big difference. D1 is about isolated risks and issues and change requests, but in C2, 
we are working with the combination of all of them. So sometimes none of our risks and issues are super important, but when you put them together, they pile up and become important enough. In Prince2 terms, they can create an exception. The next Prince2 process is managing product delivery. These activities are not explicit in Petri Express. That's just the interactions between the project manager and the team leaders or the supplier project managers. Although we have the project manager side of them in Petri Express. And when it comes to supplier project managers, they will have their own perspective to the project. And in that perspective, they have activities for that. Next is directing a project process. The first activity is authorize initiation. That's for moving from starting up a project to initiating a project. And these two are together in Petri Express. Therefore, we don't have a separate authorization for that. Next, authorize the project. That's A8, make a go, no go decision for project initiation. Then authorize a stage or exception plan that's similar to B3, make a go-no-go -no -go decision for the monthly cycle. Give ad hoc direction. Well, that's ad hoc. That just happens whenever it's needed. We don't have an explicit activity for it. On the other side of that, where we request that ad hoc direction, that again, that can happen at any time, but it's mainly something ha that happens in D1 and C2. And the last activity, authorized project closure. Again, we don't have an explicit activity for it in Petri Express. Okay, the last uh, Prince2 process that we can go through is closing a project process. The first three activities, prepare plan closure and premature closure and hand over products. They are all merged into one activity in Petri Express. F1, hand over the product. Evaluate the project in Prince2. We have evaluate the stakeholder satisfaction, F2. Recommend project closure. We don't have an explicit activity for that in Petri Express. Okay, that was it. Mapping the Prince2 processes, Prince2 process activities into Petri Express activities. We can do the same thing for the teams in Prince2. The first one, business case. It's a theme that is about the justification of the project. First of all, the justification of the project is described in the project description because we want everyone involved in the project to know about it and align themselves with that justification. We add that to the project description in A4 describe the project and later on we may refine it. The other things that relate to that is A8 and B3 are go no go decisions. They have a lot to do with justification because each time we send refined information about the project to the sponsor and through the sponsor to the higher levels and they check the justification of the project based on that information and they update the business case probably. And the other major thing we have related to the justification is our post-project management activities. That's all about the benefits created from the product of the project and seeing what we can do about those things. For changes, each change request will be reflected into the follow-up register as a new item to follow up on. And for the changes that are approved, they will be reflected into the deliverables map and maybe into the project description. Next is organization. The organization of the project in Petri Express is a lot simpler than Prince2. And as we talked about before, it's mainly because we have multiple perspectives to the project. When there are multiple parties working in the project, each of them has its own perspective. For the plans theme, our plans are contained in the deliverables map and somehow depending on how you interpret plans in the project description. And similar to Prince2, 
we have a high level plan first in project initiation and then in each monthly initiation we will add details to it and one extra thing that may be related to planning is g2 when we use the information about the benefits to come up with new ideas extra activities that we want to have for the product or initiating new projects and programs for progress the progress information is stored in our deliverables map mainly the fact that a deliverable is completed or not which is something we do in d2 and the actual progress is calculated in c1 for quality management a lot of expectations and requirements that relate to quality will be in the project description the specific quality criteria for deliverables will be added to the deliverables map and the specific issues related to quality or the even some of the quality activities themselves there will be follow-up items they will be in the follow-up register for risk management as we talked about before we have a unified register for risks and issues and change requests and improvement plans and lessons learned and we talked also about the reasons for having that the fact that these things morph from one form to the other and we want to keep that sequence and also we want to have a simpler process for all of them so the main management product for that in Petri Express is the follow-up register. We start doing that in our project initiation by identifying risks. And then we have a daily activity, D1, to work with the newly identified risks. Okay, we're almost done. Just one more thing. And that's about mapping the management products in Prince2 to, to management products or artifacts in Petri Express. First, the business case. In P3 Express, the business case is not one of the project documents. It's a document in the portfolio management layer or program management layer. We use some of the information in the business case and we send certain types of information to the higher levels that will be used for refining the business case. But still, the business case is outside the boundaries of the project for us. But if you really look for it, you can find the summary of that in the project description. And we have it there because the people who work in the project need to be aligned with the justification. The benefits management approach is also similar to business case outside the boundaries of the project. Although we have the post project cycle, which has something to do with it. So the concept is there, but it's not explicit. It's up to the sponsor and other people to see if they want to have a separate document for it or they want to add the information to the business case or anything else. For these four, instead of having a sophisticated approach that is customized for the project, we want to have a simple one that can be used in all of them. So we don't reflect them into a document. Project brief is more or less like project description but as we talked about before project brief is a temporary document in Prince 2 but in p Express project description is permanent it stays until the end of the project product descriptions and project product descriptions for us are the comments we add to our deliverables map so imagine that the recommended way is to have a mind map for the deliverables map and for each node in that map which is a deliverable we can have a comment and that comment covers the product description project initiation documentation is mainly a package for other things and we don't have that type of package in p3 express because the number of elements we have is really limited what is contained in a typical project initiation documentation is what we have in the project description and the deliverables map plan that's the deliverables map for us work package the extra information that may be contained in a work package in Prince 2 if we need it we will add it to the deliverables map okay moving on daily log it is not explicit in p3 express but of course it's a good idea or 
not even a good idea, almost necessary for every project manager to have something like that. The rest of the registers and logs are all unified and they are in our follow-up register. For the checkpoint report and highlight report, in general, we don't have a predefined description of what those are in P3 Express. And that's why it's not one of the uh, documents in P3 Express. It just gives some advice on how to create those things. That mainly covers the concept of highlight report, which is done in C1. And then for checkpoint reports, as we talked about before, we don't have that concept at all, unless you have subcontractors and what they create as the reports in their own perspective can be interpreted as checkpoint reports in the higher perspective. End project report and end stage report, those are for us the focus communications. Exception report, we don't have something explicit for it. And the same for issue report and lessons report. Okay, so that was it. We are done with the main part of the course, which was really long, I think. A few suggestions before I move on. First, in many Prince2 courses, most of the time in the course is spent on documents, which is not a good idea because the only thing people learn is how to create certain documents, how to plan the project, and then they don't do anything with it, which of course doesn't help any project. That was not the intention in Prince2. It's a really great system. It has a lot of potential. But unfortunately, the, the way the, the exams are formed, both the foundation exam and the practitioner exam, makes people, forces people, the candidates and the trainers to focus on those aspects, which is a pity. But when you want to give P3 Express courses, Please don't spend too much time on documents. Documents are not the main drivers in Petri Express. Focus on the process. And when you think about it, uh, it was even considered in the design of Petri Express. We don't have separate sections discussing the documents or discussing the roles. It has just one section that goes through all the management activities in the process. That's because that's the main thing we want. The documents that we create are only explained when they relate to one of the activities. And those are in fact only created in order to help us in those activities. So let's focus on those and not the documents and not the roles. And also when you want to explain the activities, you may be tempted to spend a lot of time on project initiation, maybe 70% of the time on project initiation, which is a habit coming from Prince2. But please don't do that because the distribution of the activities you see here on the diagram is a reflection of the amount of attention that each concept needs. If you think about it, we have only a few activities about planning. And then you go on, you see, we have, for example, one separate activity for celebration at the end of the project. It is like that because it has almost the same weight for us as planning. It doesn't mean that you have to spend exactly the same amount of time on each activity in your courses. It's okay, maybe you want to spend twice as much for one of them. That's okay, but don't spend 10 times more on, for example, A4 than you do for F6. The other thing, uh, which I don't know whether or not is necessary to talk, is that you really don't need to compare P3 Express with other things when you explain it in your courses. That was our topic here because you're an expert in Prince2 and you want to use that in order to understand Petri Express more easily. But that's probably not the case for your candidates. Many of them don't know Prince2, and even those who know Prince2, they've learned it, for example, two years ago, they don't remember much about it. 
So when you're teaching P3 Express, it may be easier and more straightforward if you only focus on P3 Express and keep it simple for your audience. You also don't need to explain extra techniques. It's not a PMP course where techniques are the main topic. It's about a methodology. It's like Prince do, in fact. And the same way Prince do doesn't have a lot of techniques, we also don't have a lot of techniques here. And that's not the main topic. Okay, let's talk about how the certification works. There is only one level of certification for Petri Express, and it's called Petri Express Practitioner P3P. That's different from Prince2 because Prince2 is a maximalist system, it's relatively sophisticated, and it takes a long time for people to learn it enough to be able to use it. So there's a long journey to become a real practitioner. And that's why they have two levels of certification, foundation and practitioner. But for P3 Express, we don't have that long journey. It's much faster and easier for people to learn it enough to be able to use it in practice. And that's why there is only this one level of certification. To become certified, candidates need to accept the code of conduct and pass the exam. This is the code of conduct. This is actually the practitioner code of conduct. There's also a trainer code of conduct, which is for people like yourself. And that describes the expectations from a trainer when giving a course. But this one is the practitioner code of conduct, which is the expectations from a practitioner, someone who's working as a project manager or someone else involved in the management of the project. Candidates have to accept it, and also there are questions about it in the exam. And speaking of the exam, there are 70 multiple choice questions in the exam. Some of them expect only one choice to be selected, and some of them are multi-answer questions. They expect more than one choice. For those questions, the text of the question explains that. It says that, for example, you need to pick two choices or you can pick more than one choice. Candidates have a maximum of 100 minutes to answer all the questions. It's open book. It's available in a few languages right now that I'm recording this, but the goal is to have it in all languages supported by p Express. And that's the languages that are available for the manual, the translations that uh, volunteers have contributed. Besides that, there's also a language aid. It's a machine translation. It's not 100% reliable, but it helps. So, for example, if someone has a problem with a couple of words and can't understand what those are and therefore have problems answering the question, they can use this feature to translate each sentence into any target language and go on with it. The passing score is 67%. At the time of this recording, 82% of the candidates have passed the exam with an average score of 73%. The average score is not so high as you see here. That's because the exam uses the whole range of 100% results and any score above 85% is really, really great. So don't worry if your candidates have a scores below 90%, they are still really good. And if anyone goes above 90%, that's really great. 80% of the questions are scenario based and 20% are direct questions. It's different from Prince to Practitioner. In Prince to Practitioner, there is one scenario in multiple sections, and that's used for all questions in the exam. But here, each question has its own mini scenario. There are three levels of cognition for questions. About 15% are about recalling. Those are the things you can look up in the manual and find the answer to. 55% of the questions require recalling and basic analysis. And the remaining 30%, 
require recalling and advanced analysis and deduction. For these two types of questions, people really need to have an understanding of what the concepts mean. Memorizing is not enough. It's even different from Prince to Practitioner because in Prince to Practitioner, you can still use the manual to find the answers directly. They are still using scenarios, but the answers are obvious. But in Petri Express exam, in level two and level three of cognition, people really need to convert the information in the manual into something else. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's more difficult or less difficult. It's just different. The goal was to create an exam that is not relying on memorization, not on recalling. It's an exam that's trying to discover the real capabilities that people have in order to manage projects. It checks the decisions people would make in different scenarios and the behaviors they would have. And these are different categories in the exam and the number of questions in each of those categories. All of this information is also available on the website. You can always go to the website and find all of these things. We have questions about NOOP, about the principles, the code of conduct, as I mentioned before, and there are two questions about the license and rights, the rights people have in using p Express, the Creative Commons license that we talked about. And that's important because project managers need to understand copyright and see what they can do in their projects. Most of the categories match the content in the manual. For example, first we have a number of categories for different roles in p Express. Then a number of them about different processes. Although, for example, project initiation and monthly initiation are together here. Then a few questions about different artifacts. And finally, we have these two special categories. Tailoring, that's about how to change Petri Express, because even though we don't have to change things at the beginning, we might still want to make adjustments as we go on with the project. And the last one, the delivery method, that's about being adaptive or agile or predictive. It's only two questions, but it's important to understand for a practitioner. For example, when we talked about uh, scheduling, we talked about the fact that there are two types of scheduling considered in Petri Express. One is dependency-based and the other is priority-based. In an adaptive development approach, you have to have a priority-based schedule. And in a predictive system, you don't have to, but you would probably be more comfortable with the dependency-based approach. The certificate does not expire, but it always comes with the year that the person is certified. So right now, it's the end of 2022. People who are getting certified right now get the P3P 2022 certificate. So what really happens here is that P3 Express doesn't say how long it would be valid because that's a really difficult thing to say. Someone may get certified and be really involved in using P3 Express and therefore know it very well after 10 or 20 years. They would know it a lot better than the first day. But on the other hand, some people may just go into an intensive course, learn p Express without using it, and they may forget it after a couple of months. So there's no way for p Express to, to tell how long it is valid. But by adding the year, it's practically transferring that judgment to the practitioners themselves and to people who want to hire them and so on. So someone may be comfortable with a two-year-old certificate, someone else may not. That's up to them. There's also something important here. Anyone who gets a certificate one year has access to the next exam for free. So, for example, if someone becomes P3P 2022 right now, next year, for a few months, they have access to take the next exam for free and if they do and pass the exam, they get the P3P 2023. 
and it goes to the next year. So the year after that, they also have access to the P3P 2024 exam and so on. All of them for free as long as they don't fail the exam and they don't stop taking those exams. So if they don't take the 2023, then the 2024 won't be available to them for free. So in other words, it is created to encourage people to stay in touch, stay up to date, learn more about Petri Express and really use it in their projects without being worried about spending too much money. So the last part of the course, what to do next as a trainer interested in becoming a Petri Express trainer? Well, the first step is to study the manual carefully. The manual is available online, it's in multiple languages, and like everything else in, uh, on the Petri Express websites, it's free and open. You can use it without any restrictions. Okay, that's step one. Step two is to take the Art of File Center course. It's also available on the website, and it's an interactive course. It's a story where there's a project manager working in a project using Petri Express, and the user will play the role of the first character. They will go through the story, they will have different decisions to make, and based on the decisions they make, they go to different paths. And based on that, they will have different types of feedback from their environment, and that's how they can understand Petri Express more. The feedback was really great from this course. People really liked it. It really shows it's as if they've really experienced using Petri Express in a project. Not entirely, of course, but it really helps. It's also a very good idea to encourage your learners to take this course after finishing yours. So practically, the courses that you give the workshops or lectures will replace a step one for candidates. They help them understand the manual and see how they can use Petri Express. Then you will have your own exercises and that makes it more concrete for them. Step two, with the Art of Fire Center, they can do it after your course and it will be another review, another perspective to what they've learned. It really helps. The third step is to study the Practitioner Code of Conduct and then to study the Creative Commons Attribution License that Petri Express uses. That's important first for yourself as a trainer because you want to invest on this and you have to be sure that you will have your rights. Your investment won't be wasted in the future. And the license is the most important thing here that can give you the ease of mind on that and besides that the same thing exists for the practitioners it may not be as important for a practitioner as it is for a trainer but still you need to be able to tell them what it is and finally you need to review the certification specification different things that will be in the exam at this point you can become a trainer and start giving courses and based on the experience you have in your Princeton courses, you would be able to make a lot of sense for different concepts in Petri Express. You would be able to manage your classes properly and a lot of other good things. However, if you want, you can continue first by getting certified yourself because it doesn't feel so good not to be certified when you teach people how something works and finally get certified and the last step is to become accredited become an accredited trainer this step is free of charge it's only based on quality and it's not only about evaluating the quality of your courses but also about helping you reach that level of quality so you can apply to become accredited whenever you want. And some people from Petri Express talk to you, help to see what you need to do. And for example, for accredited trainers, their, their candidates will be evaluated and sometimes even interviewed to make sure that your courses were really useful and practical to them. 
Now, if the result of those evaluations is not good enough, then someone helps you. You can work together and see how you can make it better. Although, uh, this is mainly an issue for new trainers. For someone like you who have been giving project management courses in the past, it must be really easy. Okay, that was it. We are done with the course. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it was useful to you. And we can see you in the Petri Express community, giving lots of courses and doing amazing things. <laughs>